we're so glad that you're able to join us again in the midst of these unprecedented times, although it's not the way that we would prefer to meet. It's the way that we're meeting for now. So we're thankful that we still have this opportunity to be able to meet in this format. And as we uh, have had some time to reflect on Pastor Ben's sermon last Sunday, I know I've had plenty of time throughout the week, um, when he preached about anxiety specifically related to finances, uh, perhaps you're coming into this week with an anxiety uh, maybe related to finances, but maybe related to something else. Um, there are a lot of anxieties that have been brought up um, and that uh, yeah, have started to be stirred up perhaps in your life or in someone else's life uh, due to this virus. It could be um, something to do with finances, but it could also be perhaps a family issue that has come up as a part of this or a relationship issue um, or even a work issue with having to work from home or the stress of not being able to work at this time. It's really easy to allow these worries and anxieties of the earthly world uh, to cloud our vision of a God who is bigger than those anxieties and worries, um, and who has already conquered those things. Uh, so as we worship this morning, separately, uh, but together with the same purpose, let's remember what the psalmist says about the greatness of God when he says, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. So as we sing this morning and as we worship, you can know that whatever anxieties you might be bringing in this Sunday, you're going to be worshiping a God who has already overcome those things and who will continue to overcome those things. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that you are God and God alone, uh, that our anxieties are not God, disease is not God, the government is not God, but instead that you are God and we can find our hope and trust in you. So we thank you that as we worship this morning, uh, that you have overcome the things that we might be afraid or scared of um, or have anxiety about, um, and that you are always fighting for us, um, and that you love us so much. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh 
anthem rings, God and God alone, in one cross, one grace, one name that saves, all praise to you belongs, all praise to you take a minute here and and to pray, but just want to say in the moment, in the silence, in the quiet of your home, uh, we want to acknowledge uh, that there are some great needs right now, and and perhaps you're feeling those right now. And so we want to take some time to bring those requests before God. We also want to support our partners in the GCC, and so there's a couple in Des Moines, Iowa, Adam and Brianna Bailey, that we want to pray for as well. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray that in the quietness of of this moment here, in the quietness of the time that you've provided for us to hear your voice louder than any other, Lord, that we could bring our our needs before you, our anxieties, our fears, our physical needs, our emotional needs. Lord, we know that your name is higher than any of those needs. 
we know and acknowledge that the work that you've done has already covered all of those needs and, and you have conquered all of those anxieties and fears in our lives. So, Father, I pray that this time wouldn't be a time that we would squander and that we would waste and sit idle. But we as your church would be active. That we would search for ways to acknowledge you in our homes, in our workplace, in our community. Father, give opportunities to, for us to recognize the chances that we might have to share the gospel with someone else that, that doesn't have the hope that we sang about, that doesn't know that you've already conquered death and are seated at the right hand of the Father. Lord, I pray that in this moment we can be crystal clear about that. That there's no one that's higher. There's no one greater. No one more worthy of our praise than you. And so, Lord, we think of our uh, brother and sisters in the GCC, for Adam and Brianna and, and their new little, new little one, uh, planning a church out in Des Moines, Iowa. Interesting time to be planning a church. But, Father, we hear that, that you're doing work through the, the times that Adam has with the men and Brianna's having with the ladies there. And Lord, we know that you're preparing them for something, for something great. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to build your church even as we meet in our own homes. Corporately, we're united in one mind and one spirit. And so, Lord, I pray as we come before you here even this morning, help us to be still. Help us to acknowledge that you are God and you are God alone. So that you receive all the praise and glory and honor to your name. We pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. could separate us from this amazing love what could say it's greater than our God every knee will bow down oh every knee will bow down yes every knee will bow down We're continuing this morning in our sermon series, Good and Faithful, Stewardship as a Way of Life. This morning's topic is stewarding our time for the kingdom. I'm Dwight Moeller, one of the elders here at Oak Hill. And the title for my message this morning is The Other 21. And I'll explain that title a little bit more as we uh, go along here this morning. Big idea this morning is trust that God transforms every moment from worthless to priceless. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for, I thank you this morning for so many things, uh, even many things that, that are beyond our understanding. Uh, of who you are and what you do, and, and we're going to explore as much of that as we can this morning, knowing that we won't, we won't get to all of it, because we're human and you're God, and, and that's really why we keep uh, coming back and seeking more and being in your presence, and, and so Father, bless this time, bless each person that, that is participating and, and, and listening and, and worshiping with us this morning, uh, thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I want to start out this morning with um, simply time by definition. 
And, and time, by definition, is simply the Earth's rotation on its axis. We, we got a picture here of that's the sun over in the corner, and as the Earth turns, one complete turn is one day. And, and then as the Earth orbits around the sun, one complete trip around the sun is 365 and a quarter days, and that is one year. Kids, here's something for you to do, and, it, and it's something I enjoy doing from time to time. This, this is simply a, um, a picture from Google Map, and all you need to do there is go on Google Map, click on the satellite view, and then zoom out. And you keep zooming out. I believe this picture is as far as you can zoom out, and you can uh, pan back and forth on that then, and the Earth will spin. And this is no pun. That's in real time. So like last night when I looked at it, the shadow was about over the middle of United States and we had just gotten into darkness and you can rotate that and see that go from, from night to day. And really when you turn it so it's full sun directly towards you, it's beautiful. And so check that out sometime. Um, Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, God said, And let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens, to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So there it is, right there in the, in the first chapter of the Bible where God puts that clock in the sky for mankind to track time. Was there time before that? I think there was. God doesn't need a clock to track time. We needed the clock. We go the whole way to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23 and 25. And the city has, no, this. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a uh, little background here on these verses. The new heaven and the new earth, and John sees the new city, and he's describing what he sees there. And the city has no need of the sun, of moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamb I'm sorry, and its lamp is the lamb, and its lamp is the lamb. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Is time over in eternity? I don't know. The story of the Bible spans, first of all, the story of the Bible is the story of Jesus. The story of the Bible spans all of time. So that's time by definition. Let's begin to narrow this down a little bit. Did you ever think about this when you consider time? Remember in the, in the beginning of the Bible there, um, some of those first, in the first chapters of Genesis, um, there was folks living 900 plus years. If, if I believe Methuselah maybe set the record. If he had gotten his first job with Christopher Columbus sailing to the New World, when he was, say, 18 or 20. Did you ever think about this? He would be a middle-aged man now. That makes my lifetime begin to feel a little short. The big picture of time there begins to give us context for each moment, and that's what we want to talk about, the moment, a, a moment of time, every moment of time. Back to the big idea. The big idea this morning is to trust that God transforms every moment from worthless to priceless. And you might say worthless is a strong word. Are, are you really going to say, Dwight, that my time is worthless? Well, I'm going to say it's worthless because of two things. The first thing is when you consider the short moments that we have compared to the vastness of time. And the way I really want to compare it is when we look at the priceless and compared to the priceless, it becomes worthless. It's a good time to explain that title, the other 21, simply 21 hours. Uh, and I, I think I picked that because Andre's number, it, no, favorite number is 21. So there's 24 hours in a day, right? And a lot of times these, these um, stewarding time conversations are, are, are more like, uh, you know, make sure that we're not wasting time with things that are unimportant and we're saving a lot of time for for eternal things or spiritual things or however you might word that. And those conversations are, are very worthy and it's a good thing to examine and, it, and it's a good thing and it's been a 
that conversation has been life changing for people where they said, I've, I've, I've got priorities that I simply need to change. And, and that's important. But what I want to think about this morning is let's say you dialed that in and you got to where you had three hours every single day that could be invested uh, in, in those kinds of things and they were beautiful and real and they weren't self serving. But there's still 21 hours left in that day. What if we thought wrong about those other 21? And could we, could we still wind up wasting? Uh, it's actually 87.5% of your day or way over three quarters of your time could be wasted. Specifically that time where, and this happens to me all the time, and, and I, I, think I'm, I think that means it happens to you all the time. That's what I'm going with. Um, time when I'm saying something is holding me up. This is wasting my time. Just the other day at work, like, I have plenty of time to do this, except that my time is being wasted right now. And it's beyond my control. It's beyond our control. And, and several times a week, I come home from work and I say, I would have been home two hours ago, but, and then there's a story uh, of something that took extra time. But what if I think wrong about all that time and misunderstand it and, and therefore waste it? We sleep one third of the time, and there's all kinds of other little things that that um, you know are just necessary for daily living. And and if we didn't think properly about all that time, uh, could could it be wasted? It's time to go to God's Word. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes this morning, and I need to introduce the book just a little bit. Um, because maybe the first thing that pops into your head when I say the book of Ecclesiastes is, isn't that that guy uh, like the vanity of vanities thing and he sounded kind of depressed and um, I don't read it too often. Um, you're thinking of the right book, but there's so much more in there. While Solomon doesn't expressly say that he wrote the book. There's so many indicators that, that we're confident that Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. You want to find it in your Bible there. It's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. That ought to get you there. Um, Solomon writes chapter 3. We're going to be in, in chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. And Solomon writes chapter 3. He sets it up from the perspective in chapter 2 of he goes into an explanation there in chapter 2 of all the things that he had accomplished and by man's way of measuring accomplishment. And I think you understand what I mean by saying that. Solomon had, had done everything that, that he had. Uh, he, had an, he, he keeps saying, never before me in Jerusalem has anyone, any king had this much wisdom, this much wealth, and this many women. Uh, all right, it's in verse 8. Go ahead. And a lot of wow. So there's four W's for you, all right? Uh, Solomon, Solomon had accomplished everything, and he says, in all that, I've, I've retained all my wisdom. And here's the search of the book. Uh, chapter 2, verse 3, Solomon says, Till I might see what is good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of his life, the search for purpose and meaning, till I might see what is good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. There in your Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're going to read the first uh, 10 verses for now. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and I guess right now, time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. 
Time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. So in the first nine verses, we, we have what I'm going to call a poem. And the poem is general and overarching in its nature. If you think about the circumstances that you're in right now or will be in this coming week, and you look through those verses, you're going to find where your situation, your circumstance, your time fits right into that poem. Every moment of our day is, is somehow there included. The opposite comparisons of each verse in the poem tell us that the times, the seasons, the matters, the moment that you're in right now is not eternal. It's an experience that's going to come to pass. So from that, I would, I would include in our first point there in the notes, the time of mankind is vanity. So why would I use the word vanity? Well, it's kind of the word of the book, for one, uh, the word of Ecclesiastes that when I say book. Vanity simply means vapor. The time of mankind is like a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. If you think about it, pretty much all of the time we spend doing all the things like we're going to do this coming week, we're going to do those things again, or they will be reversed soon. I work in construction. We build things. A lot of times we build things where we tore something down so we had room to build it. And somebody back in the day spent a lot of time building that and, and soon to be reversed. But the search is for things in our time that last, right? So at the end of the poem, Solomon asks the question in verse 9. He says, what gain has a worker from his toil? And right now we're concluding that, that maybe nothing. Verse 10, uh, looking a little further at this, Solomon says, I have seen the business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. Let's think about that that business that the children of man are, are busy with. So we have, a, we have a picture here of a newborn colt. And did you ever think about this? So a newborn colt can stand in one or two hours after birth. If he's not running fast by day three, a, a, a good horse owner will call the vet. God created that horse in a colt. He created us. And I'm looking at that scenario and I'm saying, but I've been monkeying around raising my offspring for 18 years. And I don't want to say too much about that because I'm going to have to watch this tomorrow with them. Uh, get myself in trouble. How about this? So uh, a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned that we spend almost a third of our time sleeping. Did you know that the male impala almost never sleeps because he's busy watching the herd, the, watching for danger? But we need a lot of sleep. And don't I have things that are important to be watching? So, so it, it begs the question, a lot of the jobs that we work so hard at, God could accomplish in a day, but, but he doesn't. And, he, and he's given us some of these things that, that take a long time, that take a lot of my time. And I'm left saying, but it never had to be that way. Um, and so we need to read further. Let's continue on. Let's read verse 11 to 15. There in your Bible, read, follow with me. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This 
is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, so the people fear before him. That which is, already has been. That which is to be, already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. So all of a sudden we take this massive shift. We, we, we've convinced ourselves that, that it's vanity. And then verse 11 says, Where's verse 11? He's made everything beautiful in its time. I'm sorry, I lost it in my notes there. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he's put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It's beautiful because God has made it beautiful. How's it, how has God made it beautiful? He's doing a work. He's doing a work that we can't see yet so that we cannot find out all that God has done from the beginning to the end. We can't find out all that God has done from the beginning to the end. But God has put eternity in our hearts and that eternity that he's put in our hearts causes us to seek what God is doing. The verse says we can't know all that God is doing, but we can, we, we've been given that ability of that eternity in our hearts to seek what God has been doing. We do actually know a lot about what God has been doing. And that brings us to our second point. The time of God is eternal. We can't know all of God's work, but we know a lot about God's work. So what do, we, what do we know about God's work? We know the time of God is eternal. So here's God's work. Here's the, here's the part that we very clearly understand. So the guilt of sin and sin has separated us from God. Jesus took the guilt of sin, the punishment for sin on the cross. God saw that punishment to be fit and a full punishment that he can bring pardon to us for our sin. So God is bringing, the work of God is bringing that pardon from sin to mankind to replace that separation with close relationship. Now I'm going to say that to phrase that close relationship really is probably the understatement of the sermon. It's the only matter that matters. And it lasts for eternity. It has real value. So that's, that's the work of God. Um, now the verse says that we can't know all of it. Here's how I think we can't know all of it. And I, and I, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's taking 18 plus years for, for Mankind to raise our offspring when it when it could have been a, a couple days or whatever. Um, we don't know all the ways that God is working in those eighteen years. He's working in the parent. He's working in the child, and in ways that we would never fathom in in people all around that situation. God is working on that close relationship with you. In every moment, in everything, in every situation, in every circumstance of your entire life, all the time, in every way. So if you do not have a personal relationship with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you can know this. The moments, the days, the years, the entirety of your life is utterly and completely wasted. If you do, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning of the end, we can't explain or fathom all the ways that God is doing his work in every moment. But in short, we can understand, uh, back to verse 9, the question, what gain has a worker from his toil? The worker has no gain from his toil, except that God is working in and through all that same toil, 
and is earning an eternal gain that is priceless both to God and to his child. Let's continue on in the passage, verse 12. This kind of begins to bring our response to that. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Our response is, is to be joyful and to do good. And to be joyful is really, is, is a joyfulness like that, that breathes a sigh of relief and says, wow, God is doing an amazing work and I can rest in it. And it's easy to do good when our hearts are resting because of all the good that we know that God has already done. And I fear here that you could be saying, well, Dwight, you're really getting close to like it just doesn't matter because God is taking care of everything. And, and the Bible calls us so many places to, uh, to strive and, and uh, don't misunderstand me to be saying there's no, there's no reason to pursue hard the spiritual disciplines that Oak Hill talks so much about. Uh, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, we've, we've talked about um, uh, treasure. You know, and Jesus said, store up treasure in heaven. And really, you know, as I think about that, think of it this way. God gives us the treasure, and he gives us a place to store it. And then when he stores it there, he calls it our treasure. So pursue those things without a doubt. As we pursue those things, verse 11 says there's so much that we can't understand that God does from beginning to end. As we pursue those things, we begin to see a little bit more of that, of all that that we can't see from beginning to end, the massive eternal work that God is doing. Uh, I think so many times we, it's, it's there, and we don't see it. It's simply as uh, we just looked in, in Corinthians a couple of weeks ago in, in uh, Pastor Ben's um, sermon series on the spiritual gifts. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, no, no one can say that Jesus is the Lord except in the Holy Spirit. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So when you're even able to utter the words of acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, it's because of that eternal work of God. Nobody's ever said that without that eternal work of God going on in their heart. Jesus said in John uh, chapter 6, verse 44, he said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So every believer has experienced so much of that, that eternal work of God or he wouldn't believe. When God calls us into ministry, it's almost like he's saying, child, I want you to come along. I want you to see this. I want you to experience what I'm going to do. Verse 13 also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Just, just reiterating there the gift of it. And when I think about that, eat and drink and take pleasure, when's the best time to eat a big meal? Well, the best time to eat a big meal is when the job is done, the work is completed. Maybe you've, you've, um, you've worked hard all day at something and you've got to that completion and, and now it's that sit back and rest in it, rest in the job well done, and relax with this meal. It's God's gift. It's God's gift to man, the verse says. Verse 14 really just continues uh, and, and drives that point home. The work of God is eternal. Verse 14 says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, so the people fear before him. I think many times we underestimate the work of God. I, I think we picture the work of God more as maybe like a rain shower where there's a little bit here and there's a little bit there occasionally now and again. And I think, I think it's better pictured like that, where it's a tsunami wave that sweeps across the land. Nothing slows it down. Nothing speeds it up. The, the work of God is everywhere all the time in such force that Romans says 
no man is without excuse. When we begin to understand that, the people fear before him. God has done it so the people fear before him. Verse 15. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. For a second there, you could think, it sounds like Solomon kind of went back to his old um, what goes around comes around kind of thing. Uh, and, it, and it's really not, verse 15 is not that at all. I want to simply explain verse 15 to you this way. If you're sitting here listening to this this morning and you're saying, I understand all the things you're saying, Dwight, and I, and I want to believe that, and I want to have it make sense to me, but I'm looking at what I'm going to spend my time on next week, and it's big, and it's hard, and it's scary, and, and I'm just not sure if I'm going to be able to keep my mind there and, and believe all those things and continue to rest. Verse 15 is this. It's like God standing right beside you and he's saying, this is new circumstance for you, but it's not new circumstance for me. Fact is, I've been doing this for several thousand years. I've walked people through the exact circumstance that you face that's brand new for you. I've been there. I've done that. I've shown them the way as we went along, and I'm going to show you the way as we go along just like I've done so many times before. Every moment that you believe that is a moment well stewarded, stewarded very well. Every moment that you trust his presence and his power to save is priceless. Every moment that you trust his presence and his power to save is priceless. I want to pray a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou been thou forever will be summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in
great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand has provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto Thanks for joining us this morning. If you're new to Oak Hill, we're so glad that you came here today. And we just encourage you to leave a note in the chat and then head over to Oak Hill Fellowship slash or dot com slash connect to let us know how we can connect with you. We have uh, several family values here at Oak Hill, and one of those is bold preaching. And so we'll be online again next week in our series, Good and Faithful Stewardship as a Way of Life. Mike Bose will be preaching uh, this coming Sunday, so be sure. Be sure to, to be encouraging him this week as you might interact with him, and we look forward to hearing him bring the Word next week. Uh, we also have our Bible reading plan, so I'd encourage you to be in the Word uh, as we prepare for each week's service. And uh, it's just a good way to uh, enrich your studies so that when you hear the Word preached, uh, there's a good context and a good uh, understanding of what's being taught. And one, Another one of our values here is purpose, purposeful discipleship. We've created a two-week schedule for that, and we have a plan. And so this is the week two of our plan, uh, which means we have an online prayer, prayer meeting this week. That'll be Tuesday at 8 p.m. via Zoom. And, and again, there's another one of our family values, fervent prayer. We believe that if we're praying together fervently, uh, God's work will be done, and his kingdom work will continue despite the circumstances that we're in. Uh, another way to connect, we have our family checkup Friday evening for parents. Uh, we try to schedule that for a time that's uh, for those that you have young kids can attend. So that's at 8.15 p.m. on Friday, May 15th. We just encourage uh, parents to enjo- uh, join us for that time. Uh, it's a good time of, of some um, thought-provoking questions and just returning us to um, what we believe and how we can stay focused and sharp during this time apart. And every week we have uh, several things that we can be doing uh, to be encouraged in the Word and to be uh, fervent in our, in our discipleship and our, in our devotion to the Lord. So we ha- can read through our reading plan. Uh, we can refresh one another. I encourage you to do that this week. Refresh one brother or sister in Christ uh, and encourage them this week. And then we can reach one neighbor by serving them in Jesus' name. And that's really part of another one of our values of courageous evangelism. So I would just pray that this week that would be, you would seek those opportunities to serve in your community and serve your neighbors in that way. Uh, Speaking of ways that we can be encouraged and enriched in the Word, uh, today at 11 a.m. via Zoom, we'll have a young adult and senior high discipleship hour. That's being led by Alden and Monica Bowman. Uh, So if you're in that group and you were in the class uh, prior to us being a part, uh, I encourage you that you would um, pick up in that class, and uh, just a a great way to connect with those in our community and in our uh, Oak Hill community and uh, be encouraged in the Word. Um, We have membership classes coming up Sundays beginning May 17th and then again on the 31st, and that'll be at 6 p.m. So if you're interested or have been through the membership class, that would be something if if you're watching perhaps for the first time and you've never come and joined us here on a Sunday morning, Uh, we'd encourage you to be a part of that class. It's just a good way to understand and get to know who Oak Hill is and and, uh, what what, uh, our mission is in this community. And then we have a budget hearing coming up on May 19th. That's at 7 p.m. Slightly different. It'll probably be via Zoom, uh, but we'll receive a link and give you more details for that uh, as the the details come together for that. I'd encourage you all to hang out uh, for the live chat after the service. We have a fun topic Uh, some encouraging scripture videos to share with you. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, would, take that time. It's it's kind of a neat way to interact. It's a different way than we typically would, but it just kind of gives you some of that fellowship time that we we don't get being here together on a Sunday morning. And know beyond all these things that you are loved. Thank you. Have a great day.
Brothers, we wanted to share some scripture with you today as an encouragement. Uh, these verses are out of Psalm 147, verses 1 through 7. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, and he gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Praise our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts, lifts up the humble, and he casts down the wicked, the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. We miss you guys. We look forward to being together again. Be encouraged by these words.